Welcome to our June edition of our TMIT National Research Testbed High Performer Webinar. Uh, our topic today are the new oral anticoag anticoagulants and the new patient safety challenges that they, uh, that they bring with us. Uh, those of you that do not have the slides, I'd just like to remind you uh, to go to safetyleaders.org to get them. Those that are on the slides, I'm on slide three. I just want to remind you to turn the volume all the way to the maximum on your computer uh, to make sure that you can get good and adequate audio. If you can't, I'm on slide number four. Click on the phone icon at the bottom of your page of the window open for the WebEx. And if you click on that that icon, uh, then you'll that will allow you to uh, uh, let us know, and we'll be able to get you a better line or a landline. Um, I'm on slide five. For those of you that don't have the slides, go to www.safetyleaders.org and click on the webinar, the the upcoming events, and the webinar for June 16th. And when you cl uh, click on the the link. You'll come to a page of this webinar. You'll see a picture of Dr. Alan Jacobson. And this is where we'll have the final slide sets if we make any additions, uh, any of the national reports that we want to make available to you. And you can come back and watch the webinar live and on demand uh, when you do. I'm on slide, and you can download the slides now. I'm on slide seven to remind you the addresses for our Facebook uh, and Twitter for our organization. And on slide eight, I'm addressing our purpose statement and our mission. So our purpose at TMIT is we will measure our success by how we protect and enrich the lives of families and uh, that of patients and caregivers we serve. Our mission is to accelerate performance solutions, that save lives, save money, and create value in the communities we serve and the ventures that we undertake. We are on slide uh, nine. And that is the slide of disclosure statements. And we want to make sure that you recognize that Dr. Jacobson is collaborating with a number of uh, folks in industry. And he's been very transparent about this. And his business relationships are noted. And TMIT uh, uh, is not uh, presenting any material referable to a product, service, or technology. And uh, this uh, new topic uh, is a very important topic. And I think we have to work with industry to understand what's going on and the latest information. On slide 10, we have Jennifer Dingman, uh, who is our uh, patient advocate, who will uh, start us off before we have Dr. Jacobson present this very important topic. Jennifer is the founder of Pulse, Persons United in Limiting Substandards and Errors in Healthcare. She has been a co-founder of Pulse, the American Division. She's been a patient safety advocate with us for many advocate. years. And we're very blessed to have her. She is a published author. She's worked on a number of national committees and uh, councils with the federal government uh, and has been a co-author of the NQF Safe Practices section that refers to patients and families and was involved in each of the practices uh, in the subsection where we address how patients and families can participate. Uh, Jennifer, would you please lead us off with a 30-second inspirational message? Uh, good, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. This is a very important webinar. Uh, it's near and dear to my heart, and I'll talk more about that later when uh, we're having our panel. And I'm just so thankful that you're all here. Again, as I urge every time that I am participating, please share the recording of this very, very valuable webinar with your colleagues. And thank you for caring about your patients enough for being here today. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. And I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Denham. Thank you. Uh, thanks a, a lot, Jennifer. So I'm going to rapidly go through a news update and also address the webinar polling that we uh, undertook in May uh, to give you a follow-up, but also some polling we did on anticoagulation management because this is a critical new topic. So the first uh, on slide 13, the goals and priorities for healthcare organizations to approve IT, a report commissioned by the federal government was released by RTI. Uh, we recommend that you read it and review it. Uh, safety issues have been identified, and they identified six categories of safety issues on slide 14. Leadership, culture and engagement, 
planning and readiness, installation, training and proficiency, upgrades and conversions. These technologies are terrific. They're absolutely vital in coordinating healthcare information, but they introduce an entirely new set of potential risks for patient safety and quality. A little bit more detail is provided on slide 15, and we provide this to you not to go over it, but just to remind you that this is a really important report. Uh, not, uh, uh, not that it's the only report, but it is very important to be able to uh, understand where things are going in health IT and, a, and an exploding area for patient safety officers. As we look at slide 16, we'd like to remind you of the IOM socio-technical model of health IT and just remind you where this came from. So this is in the RTI report. However, in the 1999 report uh, that, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, the 2011 report by the National Academies of Sciences, and that, at that time called the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine, uh, a really terrific report was put out regarding patient safety. This is one where they recommended uh, use of the CPOE flight simulator, which, is, as you all know, uh, we were uh, uh, very directly involved in uh, funding and developing uh, uh, that is now being used by uh, the Leapfrog Group and others. Uh, it also addressed uh, the potential for a national patient safety board-like function that should be uh, focused on, and it really focused on, I think, on a terrific area uh, of uh, categorization of health IT and people, technology, process, organization, and external environment. All of these dimensions are really important. And you'll see this socio-technical model, I think, popping up over and over again as you look at health IT. The next topic was uh, we covered three or four topics over two or three webinars addressing the active shooter readiness uh, for hospitals. We now have one, uh, one such event every uh, week. And as we dug into this topic of the all-cause threats to uh, hospital caregivers and patients, we realized that there were some very important topics that pertain to schools from K through college as well as hospitals. And it turns out that the leading causes of death in not only your staff but their families uh, always end up in the top ten, and they include anaphylaxis, sudden cardiac arrest, choking, opioid overdose, transportation accidents, and active shooter events, in addition to the other topics you see. So this week, actually, we've been developing a core curriculum, uh, and those of you that watched these uh, webinars that we uh, presented earlier this year, we're covering those topics in this uh, program. And as you know, the Orlando shooting event that occurred in the last week illustrates the critical importance of ad addressing mass casualty and actually airway and uh, bleeding, specifically bleeding. And while they were waiting during the time of negotiations with the active shooter, uh, uh, people were bleeding and understanding the uh, importance of tourniquets, understanding the use of Israeli bandages, understanding point pressure on arteries can have an enormous impact. On this particular event, perhaps not. We don't know enough detail. But we do know that, uh, that the number one cause of fatalities in events like Columbine, the events that have happened in hospitals and the, the recent event, the number one cause of death, of preventable death, is those, are those bleeding out from extremities. Next topic was that, that the CNO claims a hospital, a, a CNO claimed a hospital forced her out after she raised concerns about the EMR. We're seeing a lot of retaliatory news now, news about caregivers who are reporting that there are patient safety issues, and now these are starting to hit the press. Uh, so we're seeing with ARC on slide number 20 that it's urging hospitals to come clean on uh, the issues uh, of patient safety uh, and quality. So we're really fighting the battles in the trenches of uh, the overuse, misuse, and underuse of power of the leaders in being able to focus on patient safety and quality. And a number of articles like the Insurance Journal article we're being honest about uh, medical errors being critically important. You can see on slide 22 yet another example of, um, of staff now really starting to go public with issues uh, re relating to patient safety and quality. And we go back to the ARC report of the 600,000 employees that were interviewed at 1,100 hospitals and how the majority of the staff are afraid either to report medi uh, uh, medical error, medical accidents, uh, 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 even while they're happening. And uh, I think this uh, begs uh, us to really focus on leadership. Um, 
Finally, the topic of fa home family caregivers. We've been monitoring this for you all every week or every month. We've been monitoring, monitoring it on a daily basis, and we'll give you an update in the next webinar. But the family caregiver movement and the need for family caregivers is critical and the need for us to support them. And the federal and state laws that are addressing this uh, will give you an update in, uh, in July. Um, the, we want to draw your attention to the article, uh, uh, the June 13th JAMA article uh, regarding improving safety for hospitalized patients. Uh, make sure that you have this article, whether you agree with it or not. It's important you know your senior leaders are going to want to ask you to respond uh, and, and, uh, to it. Now, as we really start to focus on uh, uh, the topics of, of um, importance this year, those are the conditions that are frequent, severe, preventable, and measurable. And we, in last uh, month's webinar, we addressed the 10 leading causes of death, and this is why we're focused on this medical tactical area of the top 10 causes of preventable death. And as we looked at the 10 leading causes of death by age group, I won't go through them. You can see uh, uh, where they land. Uh, those highlighting unintentional injury deaths, uh, we included as well because we're using this as foundational information for the MedTAC program that we're putting together. And then the third slide are those highlighting violence-related uh, deaths. And uh, we're seeing a, an uptick and a continued trend of active shooter events in our hospitals. And we're really going to need to focus on what do we do in terms of prevention uh, uh, and uh, readiness. Uh, so prevention, readiness, response, and performance improvement. So in our anonymous polling questions last month, we ask, I would like a medical tactical certificate course to cover anaphylaxis, sudden cardiac death, choking, opioid, OD, and injury from active shooter events. 47% of you all gave it a 10. Yet we had a small group that said they strongly disagree. I'm not sure why, but this is what we got from our, 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 our polling. And then kind of a mixed bag under, the, uh, under it from nine, 6 to 9. We are building such a course, uh, and you can see that the results uh, are pretty strong in support of such a course, which we'll ma be making available. We're building it out for um, the scouting programs for Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, for healthcare organizations, for non-clinical staff, and for universities. I'd like a webinar on patient safety and caregiver safety that could be offered for non-clinical staff. 58% of you said 10, so we think that this program that we're addressing with the most common preventable deaths for non-clinical staff is important. Incorporated in it will be the AHA uh, CPR course, uh, uh, so that credit from that course will be uh, addressed. One of the areas was opioid overdose, which is just a, a catastrophic crisis proportions. 47,000 deaths last year, likely to tip 50,000 this year, and the enormous uh, on-ramp that opioid painkillers have. So if someone is addicted to alcohol, they're two times more likely to go to morphine, cocaine 15 times more likely, but 40 times more likely if uh, they're uh, taking opioid painkillers. And we addressed in our last webinar that the University of Texas in Austin, that the students have seen such a, a crisis of opioid overdose just in the student body that, uh, that they're requesting Narcan be at all the facilities and carried by the security staff. We have uh, one of the UT college students as part of this MedTAC program here this week working with us, and uh, he re re has reiterated to us how much uh, good kids that are coming from good homes that are not underprivileged communities are getting hooked on these prescription meds and dropping out of college or really having problems. So that brings us to the on-ramp or the introduction to Dr. Jacobson, and we want to draw you back to January uh, 15th. Um, when the National Action Plan for Adverse Drug Event Prevention Report uh, w w was addressed. It, the report came out in 2014. We did a series of webinars on the three most common, preventable, and what HHS and CMS are likely to focus on, adverse drug events, and anticoagulation management is one of them. And a feature of them are the novel agents or new agents or direct agents. And Dr. Jacobson graciously agreed to come back and help us update this. Um, this report back then showed that the impact of the ADEs is enormous. And, and if you want to go back to our prior webinars in 2015, you can go to safetyleaders.org. We, we did one webinar for all three of the major adverse uh, drug events, which were anticoag, diabetic agents, and opioids. 
Then we did a separate one for each one. And then you wanted so much more, we did a summary on each one. And we had one of the former leaders from CMS uh, address it. Uh, this is a uh, uh, wishbone diagram of how complex the system is related to the adverse drug events to let you know that uh, the federal government really dug down into these topics. On slide 34, they focused on a number of medication classes that included antibiotics and antineoplastics and corticosteroids. However, it was the anti-coag, the diabetic agents, and opioids that ran the table in terms of being common or frequent, clinically significant, and preventable. And as you can see at the top part of the chart, they didn't believe that uh, perhaps they could be as preventable as, they, as the, the bottom three are. So the federal government focused on these three uh, with, with their, their, uh, uh, their energies. And so on slide 35, very important slide, 67% of all emergency hospitalizations in 67% of all ED admissions these three drugs, in one way or another, are implicated. And so they're anti-warfarin, anti-coagulants, insulin, diabetic agents, and opioids, which is staggering, and that's why they went after these three. So they focused on these three, developed work groups, and developed recommendations, and we know that incentives and financial incentives are going to be tied to them. With anticoagulation uh, issues, they, uh, st they stated that anticoagulants are probably underutilized less than one half of atrial fibrillation patients eligible for warfarin are receiving it. Over 75% per, uh, of patients uh, with VTE may be non-adherent. So not only do we have an adherence and persistence problem, but then those that are using it, using these anticoag agents, we have some challenges. And so the, on slide number 38, and again, I'm, not, I'm, I'm putting these slides up so that I can remind you to go back to the in-depth presentations and, and look at these reports. We covered them pretty thoroughly. And today, what we really want to do is, uh, is to address the new and novel agents that introduce new patient safety issues. And Dr. Jacobson was gracious enough to come back to us. And Dr. Boats, who wished he could be on it, is at MD Anderson and saying he's got an enormous number of patients coming in with uncontrollable bleeding from the new agents and that there really is, are some preventable things that we can do regarding the new agents. But you see 68% of the ED visits with acute hemorrhage, 27% with lab, laboratory abnormalities, 40% of ED visits for acute hemorrhage resulted in hospital admission. So those of you that are managing big populations, these are going to hit your numbers. As well, outpatient uh, anticoagulation management, here's the prevention side. And I'm not, I put, I put slide number 39 in for completeness, but I really want to uh, address um, uh, uh, these uh, uh, prior anticoagulation uh, presentations that Dr. Jacobson uh, undertook with us. So in February 19th and April 21st last year, he did. We pulled you after he spoke. He, he got record high net promoter scores as a speaker. And if you, um, if you look at these, uh, uh, these slides uh, of... Uh, I'm, and Carl, I'm trying to back up here. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so when we pulled, uh, when we pulled uh, you about a deep dive on anticoagulation best practices, we got 55% of you gave it a 10, and then and then it dropped down to 18 and 12 or with nine or eight. We ask, I'm interested in joining a community of practice on this. We're putting together a lot of information on it. The, the urgent cause of death programs for MedTAC have superseded it because they're so large, uh, but we really are considering it. I need help building a bus an ROI business case for anticoagulation programs. So about 24% of you gave it a 10, 11% gave it a 9. There were some pretty high neutral numbers in our polling there. And we ask, whether, we ask you um, to state whether your organization has anticoagulation expertise to share with others and fully 11% of you felt like you did. And so we really believe there's an opportunity for a community of practice uh, there. We ask if you wanted to be connected with your community pharmacists, and you can see 26% of you gave it a 10 there. So that's a quick, fast drive-by on uh, some of the news, the focus on anti-coag by the federal government, and the fact that our audiences last year really appreciated Dr. Jacobson's uh, 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 briefing here. 
he, we have been working with Alan for many years. He is a terrific, we just put him right at the top of the list as a national expert on this topic. He's an assistant professor of medicine, Loma Linda University School of Medicine. He's the director of the anticoagulation services. He really keeps up on this area and is so gracious to help us again today. Alan, would you please uh, uh, brief us now on the new anticoagulants and the new patient safety issues uh, and what prompted this again where many of the docs in our system were saying we're starting to see uh, uncontrolled bleeding coming in and problems with these new medicines. So, Alan, would you take it from there? Well, it's a, a privilege to be back with you folks and to uh, talk about a topic that I'm very passionately interested in, and we actually just had the international thrombosis meetings um, about two weeks ago, and this topic was a very high priority in a number of the presentations focused specifically on some of the safety aspects of these newer agents. Um, again, we've already talked some, as was mentioned, I've been involved in two prior discussions uh, where we looked at the broad spectrum of oral anticoagulants, and much of our focus, particularly in the first presentation, dealt with warfarin because that has been the most commonly used. Um, part of what is behind what Chuck commented on with colleagues calling him and saying, we're seeing more and more major bleeding from these new drugs, is that these new drugs are now approaching warfarin in terms of when you look at when a patient comes in and has newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation, even with the initial introduction of these new agents, it's taken five years before these new agents now are taking roughly 50% of the new patient market share. So as we see more and more patients on these medications, and that transition has been gradual over the last five years, but as I say, for new starts on medication, many of the patients on warfarin long-term have remained on warfarin. They're resistant to change, and that's not entirely a bad thing. Um, but part of our goal today is to um, review this and provide some perspective. As Chuck mentioned, um, I'm still as conflicted a presenter as I was in the past, um, and much of that is simply having the opportunity to work with the individuals who've actually discovered and developed these medications um, and with the reversal agents that are now becoming available. Um, what we'll do today is we'll very briefly go back over a couple of the issues that we've mentioned in the past, just that if you weren't able to attend those, you'll understand some of the context of where this presentation is coming from. But the majority of our time will focus on these newer agents and how to approach bleeding and to have some perspective. Are they causing more problems with bleeding than warfarin did? Or are they actually in advance in terms of how we manage things? So to go back a little bit, we're gonna focus predominantly on atrial fibrillation. And the reason is that bleeding with anticoagulants to a large extent is age dependent and the patients with atrial fibrillation on average are about 15 to 20 years older than the average patient uh, with a deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism. Um, and so the bleeding risks become more of an issue within that. So we'll look at the, the statistics and the data relating to atrial fibrillation, but the general principles involved apply regardless of the indication for the anticoagulant. In atrial fibrillation, um, just to go back very briefly to um, the underlying pathophysiology, in atrial fibrillation, the left upper chamber of the heart, what we refer to as the left atrium, loses its normal coordination. It actually begins to just, we use the term fibrillation, um, and literally, it's very rapid movement of that upper chamber where it contracts roughly 600 times a minute. Uh, those of you who understand pumping mechanics at all, if you're trying to pump that rapidly, you simply don't get very good flow. So essentially, it ends up just quivering. And when blood isn't moving rapidly, it has a greater tendency to clot. And the challenge is that 
all you need is a four millimeter clot to break loose out of the left atrium. And a four millimeter clot is large enough that if it then travels from the left atrium into the left ventricle on out to the aortic arch and up into cerebral blood vessel, a major brain vessel, the middle cerebral artery, for example, is only about two millimeters in diameter. So a very small clot can have devastating consequences for a patient um, and basically leaving them as a totally disabled individual. So the underlying problem we have for patients with atrial fibrillation is that um, when they go into this irregular heart, heart rhythm, it disturbs the flow in the left atrium, leading to increased risk for blood clots to form, and if those break loose, increased risk for blood clots to go to the brain, resulting in strokes. Now if I can get my pointer to advance again. So what we've seen is that for the average patient that goes into atrial fibrillation, it increases the risk of stroke roughly five-fold. The average older patient has about a 1% per year risk of stroke. If they go into atrial fibrillation, on average, that rises to 5%. As you can see on this slide, that will vary from study to study depending on the specific population. In some populations, it may be as high as 7%. In others, it may be somewhat lower. But that's why we say on average, it's about a five-fold increase in the risk of stroke. This particular slide looks at the first five studies that we used warfarin. And at that time, we didn't know whether warfarin would work in these patients to reduce the risk of stroke. And so half of the patients would be randomized to receive placebo, and that would tell us what the baseline incidence of stroke would be. And then half of them received warfarin and as we saw in every single one of these studies, there was a major reduction in the risk of stroke for those patients on warfarin. Depending on whether you do intention to treat or on treatment analyses, it was between a 60 to 70% reduction in stroke risk. And it's challenging to find a class of medications that is that effective. Most of our cardiac medications have about a 20 to 25% impact on adverse things happening to patients. So if you're using aspirin to prevent another heart attack, if the patients take aspirin, they have about a 25% reduction. If you use beta blockers to treat patients with heart failure, you, re you reduce adverse events by about 25%. The same thing with ACE inhibitors, lipid lowering. Many of our gold standard interventions have about a 20 to 25% impact on reducing the risk of adverse events from that disease state. Warfarin, to reduce the risk of stroke, has roughly a 60% reduction based on the more conservative approach, which is an intention to treat analysis. So highly effective therapy at preventing a exceedingly disastrous complication for patients, which is a stroke, and yet it's challenging therapy to utilize. Um, what we end up seeing is that not only, though, does atrial fibrillation increase the risk of a stroke, patients who have strokes due to loss of blood flow, if they have that loss of blood flow to the brain because of an atrial fibrillation-associated stroke, what we see is they are twice as likely to end up being totally disabled if they have atrial fibrillation compared to the patients who have a stroke but don't have atrial fibrillation. And that's something we've really only come to recognize over the last five to six years. Um, as we've had more and more studies, um, this particular data is from Dr. Dully, but there's also American Heart Association data in the Framingham data it's a threefold worse outcome in terms of being totally disabled. So most of the studies, it looks like you're roughly double the risk, in this case, 2.2-fold increase in the chance of being totally disabled. And yet the challenge is, if we use warfarin to try and reduce the risk of stroke, 
one of the complications that we now introduce because of our therapy is the risk of bleeding. And if you have a stroke because you bleed into the brain, that has an even higher disability. So we have very powerful therapy, but it brings with it the potential for major bleeding, including bleeding into the brain. And as most of you know, warfarin is very challenging to manage. We monitor warfarin therapy with a laboratory test called the INR. If we allow the INR to become too high, the risk for bleeding and bleeding into the brain becomes higher. If we don't keep the INR high enough, then the risk for stroke is not reduced. So the challenge is to give enough drug to reduce the risk of stroke, but not so much of the therapy as to get the patient into trouble with bleeding. Chuck alluded to this particular article that then outlined how this becomes a major national health problem. The article is out of the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Budnitz, who's the lead author, has presented on this in numerous publications over the years. This particular publication focused on older Americans and looked to see when older Americans have an adverse drug event that brings them to the emergency room, how many of them get admitted to the hospital. And as Chuck alluded to, he had a, one of the other graphs, but warfarin was responsible for 46% 46% of the patients who showed up in the emergency room because of warfarin-related complications ended up being admitted. And that accounted for 33% of the emergency room admissions that were due to adverse drug events. And that's why even though we're concerned about the diabetes agents, if you look at insulin and oral hypoglycemics combined, it comes to 23%, but if you add in the complications of the oral antiplatelet agents, you now have blood thinners responsible for 46% of the admissions. Opioid analgesics aren't quite as responsible for patients getting admitted to the hospital, but unfortunately they are responsible for a very large number of outpatient deaths, and that's why that group was included these three groups of medications are the ones where it was felt that these could be more preventable errors, where some of the things we saw on antibiotics, antineoplastics, they are public health concerns for adverse drug events and for safety considerations, but the ability to impact that is not as clear as it is for the three groups. And as was mentioned, the National Action Plan for Dr Adverse Drug Event Prevention a federal-wide initiative working with private collaborators going after three primary targets, anticoagulants, and specifically trying to reduce the risk of bleeding, the diabetes agents, and trying to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia, and the opioids, trying to reduce the risk of accidental overdoses, sedation, respiratory depression, and specifically with death. So we've talked about warfarin. It's highly effective in reducing the risk of atrial fibrillation-associated stroke. But as was mentioned, because of the concerns about bleeding, almost half of the patients who would benefit from being on warfarin are not receiving it. Now you can imagine if all the patients who should be on what would that do to the adverse drug event numbers we looked at. If we doubled the number of patients on warfarin with our current approaches and standards of practice, we would then double this number as well. And so it comes down to what price are we willing to pay in bleeding to prevent strokes? And what can we do to lower this to the lowest number possible? We will never eliminate this because many of the patients who bleed aren't on blood thinners. But what we would like to do is get this as close to the bleeding frequency in anticoagulated patients. We would like to see that rate of bleeding as close to the non-anticoagulated population as possible. So 
The question is, how can we optimally maximize our management? With Warfarin, we talked in our first discussion about the need for a systematic approach. One of the biggest problems we've seen is that patients get lost to follow-up, and something as simple as ensuring that you have a patient scheduling and tracking policy or pro computer program in place can have a huge impact on the safety outcomes for patients. We need to make sure that they get testing and that the decision support is appropriate. Usually, these are not the issue. The two biggest issues are patient education and ensuring that patients get the follow-up they need. Moving to these newer blood thinners, there is the same need for systematic management. We don't need to schedule them for blood tests, but we do need to make sure that we keep track of them and that we include in our management of the patient such things as evaluation of kidney function. If the kidney function begins to deteriorate, drug levels build up and bleeding risk increases. If liver function de dysfunction develops, then there's an increased risk for bleeding. There are drug-drug interactions, and unfortunately, we don't have lab tests at the moment, so the care providers need to memorize those drug-drug interactions, and I can guarantee you that unfortunately, the vast majority of care providers, even in the cardiology specialist community, are not aware of the drug-drug interactions that can increase both bleed risk and stroke risk for patients who are on these new blood thinners. So ongoing focused management of these patients is critical. So are these new drugs the answer to the bleeding problems with warfarin? Are they gonna create an even worse problem? Now, just a comment in terms of the terminology, I've referred to these as novel anticoagulants. We need to realize that these are now five years old. It's kind of hard to call them novel. You may hear different acronyms used. Many people use the acronym NOACs, which originally meant novel oral anticoagulant. So instead of warfarin, the old oral anticoagulant, we now have these novel oral anticoagulants. Now that they're not so novel, some people wanted to keep the same acronym, so they changed what it stood for to be non vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants. And the reason for this terminology is that the way warfarin works is it antagonizes the effect of vitamin K on the clotting system. These agents work in a very different manner. They're not related to the vitamin K effect, and the amount of vitamin K a patient may take doesn't affect the therapeutic efficacy of these agents. So you often will still hear the term NOAC. The acronym that is actually the officially endorsed acronym by the international thrombosis community is DOAC, which stands for direct acting oral anticoagulant because the molecules themselves are the blood thinner. They directly interact with existing clotting factors to interfere with their ability to make blood clots. And this is, again, in distinction to warfarin, which is an indirect acting anticoagulant. Warfarin by itself does nothing to the blood. What warfarin does is interferes with the liver's ability to produce the clotting proteins that allow us to form blood clots. So you'll also hear this term DOAC, and a third term that is out there is called SOAC, which personally I prefer, but that stands for target-specific oral anticoagulant. Warfarin interferes with the liver's production of clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. All of the novel anticoagulants specifically target one clotting protein. So one of the agents the bigotran or Pradaxa targets thrombin, factor, clotting factor number two. The other three agents target clotting factor number 10. And so they're often known as 
anti-10A agents. So the language can be a bit confusing, and that's where sometimes communication between healthcare providers can be confusing. So understanding what these terms are and that somebody may use any one of these, and even in this presentation, I will use SOAC in some places, NOAC in others, and simply refer to the novels in some other settings. So there are four agents that are now approved by the FDA and available on the market. Gabigatran, which goes by the trade name of Perdaxa, Rivaroxaban, which goes by the trade name Xarelto. They got the 10A into that name. Apixaban, which goes by the trade name of Eliquis, and Edoxaban, that goes by the trade name of Cevesa. So we used to just talk about warfarin or Coumadin and occasionally would have a problem and patients would be on both warfarin and Coumadin. We now have to be even more careful because we have seen patients who are on both Avigatran and Apixaban because people didn't recognize that both of those were fully potent anticoagulants in their own right. So there are certain generally comparable safety and efficacy data for all of these combined, but each one has unique characteristics and considerations. They respond differently to renal dysfunction. They respond differently to liver dysfunction. They have differing dosing requirements with drug-drug interactions. So just because you know how to use one of them well doesn't mean you understand the nuances of others, and these are not generically interchangeable. To, under, to just say, well, this patient is on one agent, I'll just switch all of my patients over to a different one, you can't do that across the board. You would have to consider each patient individually to see if that alternative agent is appropriate for that patient. So. There are major educational issues for the healthcare community, uh, having met with a number of different practice groups earlier this week. One group in a women's health clinic where it's all internal medicine docs, a couple of the docs said, we can't be expected to understand all of this. We need our anticoagulation service to take over the management. It's too complicated. Other physicians are much more willing to take on new agents and work with the, the risks of them. So, how well do these work? Well, as all the agents have now become available, we've had meta-analyses done that look at the combined outcomes. Um, Dr. Ruff has been involved in much of this uh, with a publication in Lancet in 2013, looking at the original trials. Uh, Hershey and Kundi have also done some of this. So if you look at how do these agents do compared to warfarin? The patients on these new drugs, are these new drugs more effective in helping reduce the risk of stroke? And it turns out that they are. On average, the overall impact of these new agents in the studies was a 19% reduction in stroke and systemic embolism compared to patients on warfarin. And when you consider how many patients have atrial fibrillation in the United States and the number of atrial fibrillation-associated strokes, to actually have therapy now that is more effective than warfarin. As we mentioned in the introduction, warfarin is one of the most powerful therapies we have with a 60% reduction in the risk of stroke. To now be able to further improve on that with new agents is beyond the hopes that people had when these came out. Specifically, much of the stroke they reduce isn't all the cardioembolic stroke of blood clots breaking loose and going to the brain, but half of the reduction is by reducing the risk of hemorrhagic stroke. As we mentioned, warfarin is very powerful at preventing blood clots from the left atrium and reducing the chance that they will break free and go to the brain, but by thinning the blood, it then increases the risk of bleeding into the brain. On the new agents that are target specific, it's probably the target specificity that is responsible for a major dramatic reduction in the chance of a patient then having bleeding into the brain due to the therapy that is trying to reduce their stroke. 
and bleeding not just into the brain tissue, but also bleeds such as subdural hematomas are dramatically reduced with these new agents, and that impacts all-cause mortality. 10% reduction in all-cause mortality for the patients on the target-specific anticoagulants when they're used for atrial fibrillation, stroke risk reduction, compared to the patients who are on warfarin. So significant advances in the effectiveness of the anticoagulation. Just for completeness, if one looks at the venous thromboembolic population, the major focus was finding doses of drug that would provide the same level of effectiveness of warfarin, but provide greater safety, and that was achieved. Patients on the new agents have comparable effectiveness of preventing recurrent deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, but with a 40% reduction in major bleeding. So who bleeds more, patients on warfarin or patients on the new drug? If one simply looks at the incidence, we have two groups now that have done studies. This particular study looks at Caldera, and we'll look at three different types of parameters. He looked at a meta-analysis, again, of multiple studies. It included 43,000 patients on novel oral anticoagulants, apixaban, dabigatran, rivaroxaban, and edoxaban. And of those 43,000 patients, 2,158 had major bleeds for an incidence rate of 5%. In those same studies, warfarin was used as a comparator. There were 29,911 patients in the warfarin arms of these trials, 1,826 major bleeds, incidence rate 6.1%, an 18% reduction in major bleeds. So with the new agents, even though the ER physicians will now be seeing more major bleeding due to the new blood thinners, patients are less likely to have a major bleed if they're on one of these agents. The reason the ER docs are seeing an increasing number is because there's increasing numbers of patients receiving these medications. If we then look at what is the incidence of fatal bleeds. So on this prior slide, we looked at what was the chance of a major bleed, which includes the fatal bleeds, but it's also patients who needed to be hospitalized or needed a blood transfusion. Um, so severe bleeds, and or fatal bleeds, if we only look at the fatal bleeds, there were 121 fatal bleeds for the novel anticoagulant patients, incidence rate of 0.28%. For the vitamin K antagonist patients, warfarin patients, 152 fatal bleeds, so a 47% odds reduction. So with warfarin, you are more likely to bleed and if you bled, you are more likely to end up dying from that. And so looking at the actual case fatality rate for the patients who had major bleeds, 121 of those were fatal for the novel anticoagulants, a 5.6% case fatality rate. Vitamin K antagonists with warfarin, it was higher. So a 32% reduction if you had a major bleed on a novel anticoagulant, you were 30% less likely to die from that bleed compared to the patients on warfarin who had major bleeds. Now, one of the other evaluations of this, um, a group from the Hamilton area close to Toronto up in Canada, uh, Mark Crowther was the senior author. Slightly different patient populations. You'll notice that when you look at the case fatality rate, you had a different population, so had somewhat higher numbers, but very similar 30 to 31% lower case fatality rate for patients on the newer agents compared to warfarin. And yet what this group did was then looked at what is the fatal bleeding per 100 patient years. 
which is probably overall one of the better numbers to look at. Um, and there was roughly a 50% reduction for the patients on the novel anticoagulants compared to the patients on warfarin. So we will see more bleeds. There are patients who will have bleeds that are bad enough to require hospitalization. There are patients who will have bleeds that are bad enough that they need transfusion. And there are patients who will have bleeds that are severe enough that they will not survive that bleeding event. But going by the study data that utilizing the novel agents offers a significant improvement in the safety and the chance of surviving a major bleed if it occurs. So the bottom line, major bleeding events are more frequent and more likely to occur for patients on warfarin than for patients on the new target-specific agents, even in randomized studies. And that a patient who has a major bleeding event while on warfarin is more likely to die from that event than a patient on a target-specific agent. And this is even in the absent absence of a reversal agent. So with warfarin, I have many doctors that I talk with, and they say it is unethical to use these new drugs if we don't have a reversal agent. I can reverse warfarin. Well, even with the ability to reverse warfarin by giving vitamin K, by giving fresh frozen plasma, by giving transfusion, in all of these studies, we had the ability to do that with warfarin and being able to reverse warfarin and not having a specific agent to reverse these novel anticoagulants, these target-specific anticoagulants, we had less bleeding on the new agents and patients were more likely to survive the bleeds. So, bleeds still happen. What do we need to do? The biggest thing we need to do is find where the patient is bleeding and fix the leak. Patients rarely bleed only because of the blood thinner. And that's why it is older patients who are more likely to bleed because they have the medical conditions that put holes in the blood vessels. They have things like colon cancer. They have diverticular disease. They have colon polyps. They get stomach ulcers. And so those things will happen to patients on blood thinners as often as they happen to the general population. The difference is what might have been a minor bleed for the patient not on an anticoagulant is now a major bleed. But the underlying issue is you have to fix the leak. If the plumbing underneath your sink gets a leak, you don't just turn the faucet up higher, you fix the leak. When a patient has a bleed, we may have to turn the faucet up for a little bit and give them blood transfusions, but that's not going to fix the leak. So we really need to focus, and even when we get to reversal agents, that is supportive, but don't forget to call the specialists, whether it's the gastroenterologist, the surgeon, the interventional radiologist, who can take care of the primary underlying problem, because all of the other things we're doing are simply supportive until we can get the leak fixed. So the group out of McMaster uh, has put together kind of an approach. I'm not going to go through details of this, but just to give you kind of a stepwise idea as to what kind of system or approach one might want to consider in these patients. When a patient shows up and there's a concern that they're having bleeding and they may be on one of these agents, doing an initial assessment for hemodynamic stability, what's the source of the bleeding? Is it GI bleeding? Is it retroperitoneal bleeding? Upper GI, lower GI? When was the last dose of their blood thinner? And if so, which one? And this one often doesn't get asked, but it's probably one of the most critical for the patient on an anticoagulant. If the patient is on a once-a-day anticoagulant and they now come to your ER at 6 in the evening and they take their new anticoagulant at 
8 in the evening, they may now be 24 hours since their last dose and have very, very low levels of the anticoagulant in the system, and the anticoagulant may not even be contributing to the bleeding. We also have patients who've been prescribed anticoagulants who never picked up the prescription. So just because the chart says the patient was prescribed one of the new anticoagulants, don't always assume that the patient has actually been taking it. We also need to look at such things as renal function, possibly liver function. Um, have those changed? If the patient now has acute renal failure, he may have built up very high levels of the drug. If the patient was started on a new medication that causes drug-drug interactions, they may have very high levels of drug, or on the other hand, unfortunately, they may have very low levels of drug. So based on this initial assessment, one can then risk stratify the patient. If it is a minor bleed, it may look major, such as some of the nose bleeds and some of those things, or even blood in the urine. Um, it may look like the patient is urinating pure blood, and yet their hemoglobin is still 1415. So sometimes we need to establish what is it. Do they just need local hemostatic measures? Um, in some of these cases, if it is bleeding from a dental extraction, um, some of those we may not even stop the anticoagulant. We need to decide on the particular patient. Uh, on some of them, we'll simply end up packing a nosebleed uh, having ENT see them and cauterize it, and then move on from there. So these patients can often be managed on an outpatient basis. The patient with moderate bleeding, which sometimes would classify technically as being major bleeding, these patients will often need admission. They may need blood product transfusions. They may need colonoscopy or other interventional procedures to identify the source of the bleeding. Uh, they may need monitoring of the hemodynamic status, and if they deteriorate into a more major bleed, they may need transfer into the intensive care unit. But looking at do they need withdrawal of the anticoagulant, do they need mechanical compression, if they had an angiographic procedure and they're now bleeding into the groin, they may need mechanical compression on that bleeding site. Um, so a number of considerations. And then for patients that have life-threatening bleeding, you do all the things you do for the moderate bleed, but these patients do need to be in an intensive care setting. One needs to either look at nonspecific antidotes, such as four-factor PCC, activated PCC. We do have one specific reversal agent available now, I dare you, Cizumab, can be considered for patients who are on Dabigatran or Pradaxa, and Dexanet, is a specific reversal agent for the three anti 10 a agents that is in development. The FDA needs to make a decision in August this summer as to whether it will approve it for market release or need additional studies. And there's other adjunctive therapies that can be considered, desmopressin or antifibrinolytics. But while this is all going on, one needs to be looking for where is the source of the bleeding. So don't just focus on treating the bleeding with blood products and supporting the blood pressure, make sure that in parallel with this, we're pursuing where is the source and how do we plug the leak. Before we would consider using a reversal agent, we want to be pretty sure that the patient is taking a novel anticoagulant. Again, for the specific reversal agents, at the moment, they are class dependent. I dare you, Cizumab only works for Dabigatran. So if the patient is taking one of the three anti 10 a agents, rivaroxaban, apixaban, or edoxaban, giving I dare you, Cizumab will not help at all. We need to know when the last dose was and does it even need reversal. Um, and at the moment, we obviously don't have a specific reversal agent if the patient comes in today, and so we would need to look at things like a four-factor PCC if it was a patient on rivaroxaban, apixaban, or edoxaban. Um, but the reversal agents have a limitation. They can only eliminate the anticoagulant contribution to the bleeding problem. 
they rarely stop the bleeding because they don't fix the underlying problem. If the patient has an ulcer that is eroded into a stomach artery, the reversal agent is not going to stop that bleeding. But the recent thrombosis meetings, they showed an actual endoscopic video of a patient and showed the stomach ulcer, and you could see the spurts of blood coming out from the artery. And some of those patients, the erosion is bad enough that one simply cannot get the bleeding stopped because of the severity of the erosion into the blood vessel. So just to remember that most deaths from major bleeding occur in patients who aren't on blood thinners. It's patients who develop the severe pathology that triggers the bleeding in the first place. So do we really need reversal agents then? Um, well, even with the new agents, we have less bleeding and it's less likely to kill a patient, but even with these new agents, major bleeding remains in two to three percent of the patients. Um, up to 5% as we saw in terms of the incidence rates. And the rate of intracranial hemorrhage is still not trivial. And there may be patients for idereucizumab, the reversal agent for dabigatran, it is indicated both for the treatment of life-threatening bleeding as well as to allow patients to go for urgent surgery. So if a trauma patient comes in, and they took their Pradax or Dabigatran two hours before coming to the ER, they now have full dose anticoagulation. In those patients, by giving idereucizumab, which can be given within 10 minutes, if that's a trauma patient, you can give them the idereucizumab and within 10 minutes, they're ready to head off to the OR with essentially no drug left on board. So very rapid acting. And Dexanet works a little bit differently, uh, is not yet approved, so we don't know what settings that will be approved for. So the future is going to be exciting. We will learn more about how to manage these novel anticoagulants. We'll be looking at new indications. We may be able to develop lab measurement, lab measurement which may help us on certain patients, identify patients at high risk for bleeding because of inappropriately high blood levels. And we'll continue to explore the boundaries of reversal. And each one of the national meetings at the moment, we end up having people who say, well, here's how we're using it in our setting. Here's how we're exploring it in our setting. How will this work in patients going to surgery? How can we use endexinet? Um, and it will be exciting because, believe it or not, even though we're talking about the novel anticoagulants, there's a novel group of novel anticoagulants that are already on the horizon and in phase one testing that are anti-factor 12 and anti-factor 11 agents. So the anticoagulant issue will stay around. So TMIT is they want action. So what action can you consider taking when you leave here? And the things that I think you need to look at, much of what we did was to try and give you perspective that even though you see there's increased rates of bleeding or sorry, increased numbers of bleeding patients coming to the emergency room, that's not entirely a bad thing because it means more patients are being managed with the drugs that overall have less bleeding than if it stayed on warfarin. But as we've seen, even with a 20% reduction in major bleeding, that wouldn't get it less than insulin in terms of adverse drug events. So what are the things you need to be able to do? Well, one of the biggest issues is making sure that patients understand. It's amazing the number of patients who haven't really had a good discussion that this new drug to reduce their risk of stroke is a blood thinner and will increase their risk of bleeding. Now, it might get mentioned in 15 seconds of fleeting passing, but what every patient should be hearing and if you have a hospitalized patient, to look at your patient education program, does it include making sure that the patient has been made aware that being on this medication will increase your risk for bleeding, that bleeding may be bad enough to require hospitalization and blood transfusion, and it may even be bad enough that you may not survive it. Patients need to understand that, and they need to have it reinforced. 
And yet, if that's all you're going to tell them, their response should be, why are you giving me something that could kill me? And so it's important that patients have also understood what is their underlying disease state, what is their risk for stroke, what are the outcomes of a stroke, 40% chance of permanent disability if they have an atrial fibrillation-associated stroke. So making sure that patients understand and that they understand what to do if there's any question of bleeding. So we say time is brain, time is heart muscle cells. Well, it's the same thing here. The sooner the patient shows up, the more time we have to try and prevent a fatal outcome and to reduce the severity of the event. So if the patient starts saying, you know, I've got a lot of more heartburn and other things, we want them to let us know. Don't wait until your ulcer erodes to bring it to our attention. You start getting anything that may indicate an increased risk for bleeding, let us know. And then at the systems level, we need to make sure that we have some kind of systems and policies in place. What do we do for these bleeds? Who do we use reversal agents on? We've had four-factor perthrombin complex concentrate approved within the last couple of years here. If a warfarin bleed patient comes in, I would hope that your local facility has a policy because that's the specific indication for four-factor perthrombin complex concentrate is to reverse warfarin rapidly. We can now reverse warfarin in a much more rapid manner than we ever could two years ago. So the new four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate, K-Centra, um, need to be available with policies on who would get them in what settings. And you need to have, at this point, you should have a policy as to who would be eligible for idereucizumab if they came in and you need to ensure that it is available in your facility. If a patient comes into your facility on Pradaxa or Dabigatran with a major bleed and you don't have availability of the specific reversal agent and that patient ends up with a fatal event, there's going to be a lot of questions asked after that because we now have modalities that are continuing to improve. So making sure that your medical staff understands, that your ER staff understands, that they know how to give the agents. Idereucizumab is currently available. We will likely have Andexanet before the year is out, probably within three to four months. Um, and there's enough information available for people to know. But again, with Andexanet, it works on all three of the factor 10A inhibitors, but with different doses. So you can't just say give andexanet. You need to know which anticoagulant is the patient on. Do I give a standard dose? Do I need to give a double dose? How long do I need to run an infusion? So each one of the four target specific anticoagulants has different nuances and the reversal of each one with the new reversal agents will have different approaches. So even with the new agents, safe and effective anticoagulation still requires competent management, including education. It's not just that we need reversal agents. We need to educate our medical staff on how to utilize them and to have systematic approaches to patients who come in with bleeding. And we need to educate the patients all of these patients should at least be considered for having a medical alert bracelet so that if they come to an ER with a bleeding event, the ER knows which medication they are on. These are not casual use drugs. They're very powerful drugs that can prevent the disabling complications of stroke, but they can cause major bleeding events and they need conscientious management. So that's the end of my presentation. I think we have some time for questions. Chuck, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, boy, you know, this, uh, this was a wonderful presentation and uh, really chock full of really, really important uh, issues. And Kyle, if you can turn control over to me, uh, I'll advance uh, our, our slides from here. But uh, the first question that uh, 
uh, that I would like to do, to ask you, and, and maybe what we could do, uh, well, let's do our polling. We'll do our polling, Alan, so then the whole balance of the time can be on our Q&A. And uh, Kyle, would you put up the polling questions for us? And so we want to pull this audience on this really critical topic. And so uh, the first question is, I am interested in a deep dive on anticoagulation best practices and protocols, including the new medications. And this kind of a deep dive, I would envision getting our emergency medicine docs and some of the organizations that have direct, developed checklists and gone through the process of a thorough evaluation of whether they have the medications available, you know, do they have a good check, checklist and protocol on last dosage taken, and, and really implement the things that Alan uh, is stating uh, we really need to address because uh, it, it's clear that these are medications that are going to continue on the rise. They have a benefit over warfarin. They, uh, they also are, are coming in with, in increasing numbers because we see the increase in prescriptions. So I think it really is time for us to tackle this in a deeper dive way with folks that have started from ground zero, say, Alan, that they started to realize they have a problem and they need checklists, protocols, make sure that they have their formulas, formularies squared away and they have an, a, a solid approach right down to the nursing staff. So that's the question. Would you like to have a webinar or a deeper dive on that? The second question is, I'm interested in joining a community of practice on anticoagulation management. We want to confirm that people still want to do that uh, now with this evolving area and it being one of the, this area of anticoagulation being in the top three of preventable, frequent, and severe adverse events. The fourth, third question is, again, we want to confirm with this audience the interest in an ROI business case for anticoagulation programs. And, Alan, I'll come back to you in just a minute with my first question is, are we putting are we putting enough patients on anticoagulation? Uh, are we still, do we still have a significant number of patients that need the treatment regardless of whether it's warfarin or a new agent? And so the question here is, I need help developing an ROI business case for an anticoagulation program. And this ties back to big populations. Now that we're doing population management, we really need these programs in place. In the old days when we didn't get paid for an anticoag clinic, people would argue against it. Now I would argue for it because of the cost of managing these cases. And then the, the last question is, my organization has anticoagulation expertise to share with others. Please tell us if you've started such programs, you've implemented things that Alan's talking about, and give us a 10 on that, and we will come back to you. And then the last question is, I'm interested in collaborating and connecting with my community pharmacist. We got uh, a, a positive answer last time. We now know that we've got, now we've been reaching out to community pharmacists to see if they'd be interested in collaborating with organizations, and the answer is yes. So what we'd like you to do is tell us, you know, if you would like to, and we're going to create a, a, a national map and start helping connect folks. And then the last, uh, the pretext entry question are the topics in anticoagulation management I need help with are, if you need checklists or programs, and then the last free text question uh, on slide 91 uh, is uh, new topics in any area beyond anticoagulation, new hot topics that you're having challenges with, we'd like to have you kind of address them. So I'm going to come back to you, Alan, and I know Jennifer has a good question regarding vitamin K and supplements and nutritional supplements. Um, but, uh, Alan, my first question is, are, do, do we still have a challenge or a problem of not anticoagulating patients that really need it and the fear of putting them on these medicines when they could really benefit from it? Is that still a, a problem? It, it remains a huge problem. And the one area that demonstrates that is the numbers of, end of, of physicians and care providers who will still use aspirin. Uh, the only study that looked specifically at this was with apixaban. And if you looked at the numbers needed to treat by using apixaban instead of aspirin, you prevented three strokes for every major bleed you caused. Now, if that's not a good return on an investment, Almost everybody would say, 
if you prevented one stroke for every bleed you caused. That would be pretty good. To be able to prevent three strokes, where people don't recognize how many complications and bleeding complications aspirin can have, and it doesn't do anything for the atrial fibrillation patient. So not only do we still have large numbers, most of the patients going on to novel agents are simply patients who would have otherwise stayed on or be placed on warfarin. So we're only seeing a very small expansion of the universe of anticoagulated patients because physicians still don't understand the new drugs very well. Uh, with one group I met with yesterday, they said, look, until our healthcare systems anticoagulation clinic will start taking care of patients on these new drugs, we will not write prescriptions for them because we don't use enough to feel comfortable prescribing them. Wow. So they say, so if we, I only have so five really, or 10 patients, so, so it's a big so issue. We have to really, yeah, so we really have a lot of an, a patients that need anticoagulation and then the choice of what we use and getting the anticoagulation clinics satisfactorily competent for the clinicians that will write the prescriptions for them to feel comfortable making the best pick. And in accountable care organizations, that will work because you save money on improved outcomes. But we're still predominantly in a fee-for-service system. It becomes a real challenge. Gotcha. So Jennifer Dingman had a question regarding vitamin K and uh, sorting this issue out of dietary supplements, and, and it really speaks to the issue of systematic anticoagulation management. Uh, uh, Jennifer, would you ask the question, and I'd like the audience to submit questions in the Q&A panel on the, on the WebEx. Uh, if you have a question you'd like to have the, me voice for Dr. Uh, Jacobson, I will do so. Go ahead, Jennifer, your question regarding vitamin K and dietary supplements. Thank you, Dr. Denham. It kind of comes with a real quick story. I inadvertently stumbled on this. My husband's dad had a heart attack and had some tests, ended up with pneumonia, and stayed with us for a month and a half. During that time, he lost some weight, so we went out and got Boost Plus for him. Um, he was also, he's on Warfin, and of course he goes to the Coumadin Clinic. My husband researches everything, and he found uh, something in the supplement online that said to notify your practitioner, your healthcare providers, uh, that you're taking it. So when he told the home healthcare nurse, she kind of was stunned and said, so what does that have to do with anything? Had the same outcome when he talked about this at the Coumadin Clinic. It was like they didn't think that it had anything to do with it. Of course, we didn't say vitamin K, and that might have been the magic word. But what scares me is we have an aging population in our country, and many people are taking these medications and these supplements. And, and you know, there's a lot uh, on the website for, I believe, the Association of Anesthesiology, American Association of Anesthesiology, and some other websites that are pretty, um, you know, that talk about this. Not only are, am I concerned about uh, nutritional supplements, but then there's also some of these vitamins and herbs that might cause issues as well. And the public's really not aware of this like they should be. And I urge you all to maybe, you know, research this and put some signs out for your patients and their families so they can look into this so they understand and know when they're taking these certain supplements, they need to notify their providers about it so they can measure their uh, blood accordingly at the clinics. And um, I also would like Doctor to collaborate on that a little bit because I know he knows a lot more than I do. <laughs> but thank you so much, Dr. Denham. I'll turn it back to you. And I just went on the website for uh, Boost Plus and trying to find uh, vitamin K, and it's hard to find out what's, uh, what, you know, what's in it. So go, go ahead and uh, help us out with dietary supplements, uh, uh, Alan, and what we need to do from uh, reporting back to our physicians regarding uh, the food we're eating and vitamin K. You covered it a bit in, the, in, the, in your presentation. Yeah, there's, um, and, and it's worth being aware of this uh, and making sure that for each of you on the, on the webinar here, that for your system, you understand how education is handled. Um, it just shows that even for a therapy that's more than 75 years old, um, 
We still have major problems with ensuring consistent usage, and unfortunately, many of our dietitians are often one of the problems. Um, there's three areas of problems. One is there's a group of healthcare providers who are simply unaware that there is a vitamin K issue. And yet, as we commented, warfarin is one of the vitamin K antagonists. That's how it works. The more vitamin K a patient takes, the higher dose of warfarin they will need. Um, because warfarin is a critical component, sorry, vitamin K is a critical component in the liver's ability to produce normal coagulation factors. Factors two, seven, nine, and 10 are the vitamin K dependent clotting factors. Um, and so if a patient doesn't have some vitamin K, they may actually develop bleeding. Um, but we have a number of healthcare providers who are unaware of that. The patient may have variations in their vitamin K intake and the provider just doesn't understand what's going on and says, you're a bad patient on warfarin, so we're just gonna stop the warfarin because we can't control you. And so the patient is frustrated because now they know they're at risk for stroke, but they can't take a medicine to reduce it, and the healthcare provider is frustrated. There's another group that is aware of the interaction, and their approach then is to restrict and say, you cannot have extra vitamin K. I mean, I've met patients who for 20 years have not eaten a salad because their care providers have said, if it's green, you can't eat it. Ginger, now, garlic, mom, ginkgo. My mom is one of those. My mom, both my mom and my father-in-law were uh, were kind of programmed that way uh, with anticoag, and uh, both have had uh, adverse drug events. Yeah, and, and that's absolutely unnecessary. Um, I'm much more concerned that as the patient has a pleasant, well-rounded diet and I really don't care how much vitamin K they take. So for most patients, we start off by saying, have the diet you wanna have. If we identify that they have large fluctuations, um, then we start to ask them more specifically about the diet. And you'll find patients, especially some of the older patients, my wife is out of town for a week, and so I'm eating at McDonald's instead of eating at home, and so now they're not getting vitamin K, and their INRs go too high. Um, so our basic rule is find the well-rounded, healthy, nutritional diet of your choice that has a somewhat consistent, consistent average vitamin K intake and stay consistent. And if you want to change to a different diet, we just increase the frequency of your INR monitoring. And often we don't spend a lot of time looking for vitamin K in things. If we have a major change, so if somebody's going to go on a nutritional supplement, we ask those patients to come in and we may do once a week INRs for a while because you never know what's in the supplement or is the supplement then they're taking something else out of the diet. So many patients on supplements aren't getting salads and other types of things. So again, I'll, I'll put in a pitch for the anticoagulation forum. Uh, the anticoagulation forum is a national association of anticoagulation services. Their website is acforum.org. And on their website, they have an area that is for centers of excellence and it has tons of educational materials, including patient education materials on vitamin K and dietary intakes. This is so helpful, uh, Alan, and just uh, uh, one of our staff, thank you, for Meg Mooring from our Austin staff, uh, pulled the, uh, the data on uh, the Boost Plus, and at uh, 32 uh, micrograms of vitamin K, 40% of the daily allowance in one carton. So let's say somebody um, as, uh, as Danny says, starts taking the supplement, uh, what you're saying is if you start taking it, let your clinicians know, and if it's a major variation from your regular diet and you're not changing anything else, you might more frequently test INR and then adjust right. accordingly. And we, we actually have some patients, and it's usually elderly, smaller patients who don't have a very good dietary intake, that we will intentionally give them a vitamin K supplement and then 100 micrograms a day is often what we'll end up giving. And then for those patients, instead of needing a half milligram every other day, they now need two and a half milligrams every day 
but they have much less fluctuation day to day. So by increasing the basal amount of vitamin K in their intake, it can help actually stabilize their therapy. Um, so some people also get worried uh, with the dose of warfarin. The right dose of warfarin is the dose that gets your INR into the range. If you're on higher amounts of vitamin K, you may end up needing 15 milligrams of warfarin a day. The highest we have gone is 120 milligrams a day to stabilize a patient. But we kept very close tabs on that patient and did weekly INRs because of that change, we didn't want them to go too high. But to see patients needing 20, 25 milligrams a day of warfarin is not that unusual for us. Um, but I meet a lot of people who will say, no, I would never go above 10 milligrams a day. Or we had one on 15 milligrams a day. That's way too high. Um, no, the right dose of warfarin is the dose to get the INR into the range. Great. So we've got some good questions. Uh, I'm going to run, we'll run through them quickly because we've got about five and we can go a few minutes uh, over. Is there a bleed risk, a risk assessment tool like HISBLEED, H-S-B-L-E-D, we could use with the DOAX. Uh, and the second question is, can you speak to when you would use K-Centra versus FEBA, F-E-I-B-A? -E I'll, I'll ask you two at a time so we can get through them, Alan. Sure. Um, I'm only going to use K-Centra or FEBA in life-threatening bleed patients. Um, and, and both of those need to be used by a competent individual who has good understanding of them. Um, the challenge with both of them is they are somewhat procoagulant. And so especially in older patients who have bad blood vessels to the heart and bad blood vessels to the brain, you risk causing heart attacks and strokes with them. So those are also not casual use. Um, you know, K-Centra is specifically approved. The package insert is available for the reversal of warfarin. Uh, with FIBA, it's, it doesn't have as clear an FDA-approved indication in that setting. Um, and for the novel agents, um, it does not have an FDA-approved indication. Um, neither of them does for the novel agents, although with K-Centra, it has been used. It at least changes the coagulation parameters. Whether it helps with the bleed or not, we don't know. Um, in terms of risk bleed evaluations, there's none specifically for um, to do a quantified. But for most patients, the only place I really use has bled is in patients who may be a CHADS VASC of one or two. Um, if those patients are then a very high bleed risk for some reason, I may choose not to anticoagulate. Usually we will use something like a has bled to help identify potential bleeding risks, and it guides our education and our long-term management. So if the patient has significant renal dysfunction, we're going to follow them more closely because renal dysfunction patients like to bleed whether they're on anticoagulants or not. Um, so there isn't a specific one, but even just the CHAD score itself is a pretty good indicator. The higher the CHAD score, the higher the risk of stroke, but also the higher the risk of bleeding. And unfortunately, because we are so afraid of the bleeding, we then say, well, even though you're some of the highest stroke risk patients, we're not going to anticoagulate you because we don't want to take the risk of bleeding. And I think that risk of yeah, you don't get sued for a clot, but you might get sued for a bleed is still in the back of people's minds. The next question is from Linda Ball. You mentioned that some of uh, these agents should not be used in uh, reduced renal function. Should dialysis patients be on any of the new anticoagulants, whether or not they have uh, atrial fib? Again, this is where you very much need competent staff and to look at individual facility policies. Um, for two of the agents, uh, the package labels have been adjusted. In the past, three to four years ago, the label said if the creatinine clearance, Cockroft Galt, drops below 15, do not use these agents. The labels have now been revised for two of the agents 
to say we have no prospective human data, but based on pharmacokinetic modeling, you may end up using this in patients on dialysis. Um, so it is agent specific. Um, so it's important and to really uh, follow that. It, it's, you, you need to follow closely, and it's something that continues to evolve pretty rapidly. Um, so, again, the dialysis patients like to get into trouble no matter which agent they're on, including warfarin. Um, so that, that's a, an area that continues to change. So if you see a dialysis patient on one of the target-specific agents, that may well be the most appropriate therapy. So two years ago, we would say that's a contraindication. Today, we would say that may be the least worst choice. Gotcha. Uh, we've got, we're, we're right at our cutoff, and I'm going to indulge our audience. Uh, thank you for everybody for attending, but we've got three quick questions, and then we'll wrap up because uh, I don't want to have anyone miss their question. Um, uh, Ellen Keith uh, asked, Car cardiology in our institution has started uh, using a, a Pixaban 2.5 milligrams twice daily when patients meet all three dosing criteria. Can you comment on that? And the second question is genetic selective patients who metabolize. So there are patients with ge certain uh, genetic conditions who metabolize warfarin differently. Can the uh, can the uh, th these DOACs be affected by this? And then I'll ask you the last question. Yeah, we we have no indication that there's genetic variance, but part of the, for the SOACs. But part of the problem is because we don't have readily available lab tests there simply have not been a lot of evaluation. So my guess is at some point in time, we'll be able to identify certain subpopulations. But in the warfarin patients, the genetic predispositions still don't determine what the dose is. The only thing that counts is having the INR in the therapeutic range. And then Ellen uh, Keith asked about the Apixaban 2.5 milligrams daily when patients meet all three dosing criteria. Any comments? I know you can't yeah, if you meet, on an organization, but... If, if you meet, the, the way the label reads, if you meet two out of the three criteria, you down titrate the dose. The challenge we have to decide with individual patients is we all have a certain percentage of our patients that do not fit the package label, and there is no label-indicated therapy available, and that's where we have to use our best clinical judgment. So, so long as it's people who understand these agents well, who haven't just read through the label once the night before, um, then, you know, to, to come up with that, um, you know, with, with a 2.5 milligram dose, uh, even on dialysis, the label doesn't require you to go down to 2.5 milligrams. Gotcha. Last question, um, and then we'll go to Jennifer Dingman to close us. How important is medication compliance with these agents? The novel agents have varying dosing regimens, once daily versus BID dosing. What's your perspective on compliance? Well, again, you need to understand how the drugs work. For one of the drugs, if the patient doesn't take it with food, they lose 40% of the dosing effect. Um, you know, for one of the other agents, if it's stored in a humid environment, you may lose a significant amount of the effectiveness. Um, so the provider needs to know the agents and they need to educate the patients appropriately. Um, so we really, really need to be knowledgeable. And again, we go back to the anticoagulation clinic. Well, uh, in the importance of systematic anticoagulation. And, and, Alan, it was such a pleasure working with you on that and working on those papers with you more than, I think, a decade ago. And, and uh, you remain to be just uh, the go-to guy nationally for us uh, on this topic. Thank you so much for such a wonderful job. Uh, thank everybody for, for, for hanging in there for an extra couple of minutes. Jenny, would you close us? And God bless all of you. I hope you have a great month. We've got a great webinar for July. Jenny? Thank you, Dr. Denham. Uh, this has really been a fascinating webinar. I learned so much. Um, I, again, I just want to urge you to, to try to communicate with your patients and families about these issues, particularly with regard to vitamin K and supplements and issues of that nature, because these are life 
you know, changing events, if something goes wrong and it's not recognized and it's 100% preventable just by a little bit of patient family education. Um, again, thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor, for your wonderful presentation, both of you, and um, thank you again for everyone being here, and God bless you all. As I said, please share the, video, the audio of this with your colleagues and invite others to come to future webinars. Thank you very much, and I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Denham. Thank you, and we'll keep, I have our presenters on for a quick process improvement loop. Uh, take care. Have a great, uh, great month.